In this video, I'm going to give a brief introduction to chromatography. Chromatography is the separation of analytes based on differential partitioning or interaction of analytes between a stationary phase and a mobile phase. So basically what that means is that the mixture of analytes would be in some kind of a matrix, for example, a bunch of pollutants in a drinking water sample, and they would be introduced to another medium, which is called the stationary phase, and the analytes can interact with that stationary phase in differing degrees. So for example, some analytes will interact weakly with the stationary phase so that they will travel through the column more quickly, whereas other analytes will interact with the column migrating through the column more slowly. So chromatography can be used for both qualitative and quantitative analyses. So remember, a qualitative analysis tells you what compounds are present, but doesn't tell you how much is there, whereas a quantitative analysis tells you what is there and how much is there. The diagram on the bottom just shows how chromatography works and how a mixture of two components would be separated over time as they flow through the column. So we start out with a mixture of analytes put on top of the column, and as they flow through the column, the light green analyte starts to separate from the dark green analyte. The light green analyte and then later on, as the dark green analyte flows through the column, we can collect that. So this short video is just going to show a time lapse of how this type of separation would occur. So initially, the mixture of components is introduced to the very top of the column, and you can see that as this red band at the very top. And as time passes, you will see that the red band separates into different colors, as some analytes will stick more strongly to the stationary phase, which is that white stuff that's in the column, whereas other analytes won't interact as much and will flow through the column much more quickly. So you can see the red is flowing through much more quickly than the second yellow band, which is faster than the second kind of purplish band. And then we have another yellow band coming in after that burgundy band. So in chromatography, there are two different phases. So the mobile phase is what moves through the column. In liquid chromatography, that's going to be a liquid. It could be some kind of a buffer or some kind of organic mixture of compounds. In gas chromatography, the mobile phase is going to be a gas. And the purpose of the mobile phase is to help the analytes move through the column because the analytes are going to be partitioning between the mobile phase and the stationary phase, which means sometimes they will be interacting with the mobile phase, sometimes they will be interacting with the stationary phase. And the mobile phase helps them move through the column, so you get that separation occurring. The stationary phase stays fixed inside the column, so it doesn't move at all. It can be a solid, it can be a liquid on either a solid or the walls of a capillary, for example. So it could be like a little liquid layer that's kind of bound or stuck to a solid stationary phase. And the stationary phase is going to determine the type of interaction that you're going to be using to separate these compounds. So for example, it could be based on polarity. So if the stationary phase is polar and the mobile phase is nonpolar, then if you have a mixture of analytes that are polar, they're going to preferentially stick to the polar stationary phase and will take a long time to flow through that column because they would rather stick to a polar stationary phase than be in a non-polar liquid phase. Elution is the process of the mobile phase flowing through the column. When you put something into a column, it's called the eluent. When something comes out of a column, it's called the eluate. So there are many different types of chromatography, and I'll just list four, which are the ones listed in your textbook. So these are four different types of interactions between a solute or the analyte and the stationary phase. So we have A, adsorption on a solid surface, B, partitioning into a liquid phase, C, ion exchange, and D, size exclusion. So for A, adsorption onto a solid surface, that surface is going to have some kind of property that we want to use to separate these molecules. For example, polarity again. So if this particular solid surface is polar, then polar molecules are going to be attracted to it. They're going to adsorb themselves or stick to the surface for some period of time. And then as the mobile phase keeps flowing past these little particles, past the stationary phase, 
then the molecules will partition away from the stationary phase, go down the column a little bit, then find another piece of stationary phase that they'll be attracted to, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's called adsorption chromatography. B, partitioning onto a liquid phase. In this case, the liquid phase is part of the outer surface of that gray stationary phase material. So in this case, the molecules will be migrating into that yellow layer as they partition into that liquid phase. And at some point, they will partition back out of that liquid phase into the mobile phase where they will then be able to interact with another stationary phase particle somewhere down the line. Example C is called ion exchange chromatography, and this is like one of the experiments you did in lab. In this case, it looks like it's anion exchange chromatography, whereas in lab you did cation exchange chromatography. So on the surface of the stationary phase, there are ions that can be exchanged with other ions of the same charge. So in this case, if the entire surface of this particle was saturated with those small green negative ions, and we were to put in the analyte, which let's pretend is these red ones, those red anions would exchange with the green anions and allow those green anions to flow out of the column. And then later on, when we wanted to elute the red anions, we could change the buffer or change the mobile phase so that the red anions would flow out of the column and then we could collect it in a container and do whatever we needed to do with it after that in terms of an analysis of those anions. D is called size exclusion chromatography and in this case the stationary phase has a bunch of little holes and pits and crevices in it that are of a specific size and if those crevices are large enough for the analyte to fit into like the green ones here then they will take a lot longer to flow through the column because they have to migrate through all those little caverns and crevices to get through the column whereas something like the red guy here that is not large enough to go into the crevices will flow right past them and come out of the column a lot faster so elute a lot faster the larger compounds will flow through the column faster than the small compounds so I have just a couple slides in the general theory of column chromatography so just like in any kind of analysis the detector is going to respond to the analyte so when you're looking at spectrophotometry, like in the iron vitamin lab or the copper EDTA lab, you use the spectrophotometer that responded to the different color analytes. So the spectrophotometer is the detector. And in the case of chromatography, the detector can be a number of different things. And you'll learn about those if you continue on and take the more advanced courses in analytical chemistry. So this is called a chromatogram. So it is a plot of the detector's response versus the elution time. And if you were to look at this in real time, what you would see is a trace that starts off something like this, and then at some specific time, the analyte reaches the detector, and as it passes the detector, the signal goes down, and then the next analyte comes through, and you see the signal from the second analyte. Retention time, or TR, is the time it takes from the injection to when the analyte reaches the detector and that's measured at the peak or the very top of the peak and TM is the retention time of an analyte that does not interact with the column so that just gives you an idea of how long something that doesn't interact at all will take to get through the column so another important concept in chromatography is called resolution and it's important because when we're doing an analysis of mixtures we want to be able to separate the mixtures completely so we can more accurately quantify them and the detector signal or the area of the peak is proportional to how much of the analyte is there so we need to have a completely separate peak to be able to accurately determine what that peak area is and in turn to be able to accurately determine a concentration so these two peaks here, the first example, have very low resolution. So you wouldn't actually see the green and the red peak as separate entities if you were to run this particular sample. What you would see is what is shown by the black line. So you would see one single peak even though there are actually two components in there. So that has a resolution of 0.5. So that is not good at all. We don't even know that we have two components. Now with the second example, we can definitely see that there are two peaks and two different components, 
But the separation isn't very good because this part of the peak right here doesn't go back down to what's called the baseline, which is right at the very bottom of the plot. So because it doesn't go all the way down to the baseline, we don't know what happens after this particular point on the graph. We don't know what that peak looks like. We don't know the shape of the peak because it doesn't go all the way down. So we're not able to accurately determine its area because we don't know exactly where it goes. So this has a resolution of 1, and again, that's not a very good resolution. Now at a resolution of 1.5, that's when we almost have baseline resolution. Okay, so this point right here is almost at the baseline. Not quite there, but pretty close. And this is the minimum resolution that we need to have any kind of confidence in our measurements. We know that there are two peaks, that's obvious. And since it almost gets down to the baseline, there's not going to be a lot of error down there in determining our peak areas. There will be a little bit of error, but not that much. And how do we determine resolution? Well, the equation's over here on the top right. So resolution is determined by taking the retention time of the second peak, subtracting the retention time of the first peak, and then dividing it by half the widths of each of those peaks. So the width being, so the width being, for example, from right here to right there. So that would be in whatever time units the x-axis is. So another way to write this equation is right here. So two times the change in the retention time divided by the sum of the peak widths. So when you're measuring peak widths, just remember that that's going to be in units of time, and it's just going to be however many seconds or minutes wide that particular peak is. So that just shows you how long it takes for that particular analyte to pass through the detector. And again, something with a resolution of at least 1.5 is what is needed for any quantitative analysis. Anything less than that won't be good for quantitative analysis. You may be able to use it for qualitative. You can probably use a resolution of 1 for qualitative, and something like resolution of 0.5 isn't very useful for anything because you don't even know how many components are underneath that peak. So that's all I have for this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know.